So last time we were talking about uh, motion along a straight line or motion in one dimension. And just as a way to kind of cap that, I cap that notion off, oh, I should start a new page. Just as a way to kind of cap that notion off, let's talk about graphing, uh, graphing motion. So a lot of times you can break down the motion of complicated systems into motion just in one dimension, or at least like in one direction. And so, and then you can just graph that motion and you can kind of get a better visual understanding of what's happening. So if we can graph one dimensional motion, then we sometimes we can graph more complicated motion. So let's, let's first, let's talk about how to graph one dimensional motion. So <clears throat> when we talk about graphing, what we really mean is we mean graphing, um, graphing say x of t, v of t, and a of t. Now, in, in a lot of cases that we will deal with, the acceleration, um, a plot of, or sorry, the acceleration is constant as a function of time. And so it's not particularly interesting to graph it, but in principle you could, it would just uh, you know, be a, like a straight line. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about the types of things that we would like to be able to do to understand or to, uh, what we would like to be able to do once we have a visualized graph. Let's outline some goals real quick. So one is we'd like to be able to interpret the graph. So given a graph, we'd like to be able to interpret what kind of motion it's describing. So this is like a, a graph, like X has an XY plane and so on and so forth. Also, we would alternatively like to be able to sketch a graph given a description of motion. And perhaps most importantly, we would like to be able to sketch a graph of, of say, v of t given x of t uh, and vice versa. I.e., we'd, we'd like to be able to look at a graph, or I'd like you guys to be able to, look at a graph of the position and then roughly plot out what the velocity would be or look at a graph of the velocity and roughly plot out what the position might be. <clears throat> so let's first talk about interpreting a, uh, interpreting a graph in terms of motion. So let's, uh, let's break this one down. So the questions that we'd like to be able to answer given a graph about the motion is, are something like, <clears throat> uh, where is the object? Is it to the left of the origin, i.e. does it have negative x value? Is it to the right of the origin? Uh, how far away is it from the origin? These things are, these would, these are important properties of the system that we would like to be able to explain and answer at any given time. Uh, another question we'd like to be able to answer is, is it, is it moving? Or at rest? If it is moving, what direction is it moving in? And so on and so forth. Another question might be, is it speeding up or slowing down? Or neither, I suppose. So all of these questions in principle can be answered um, given just a graph of say the position. <clears throat> or once you, once you understand how to, go, how to do the third bullet point, then you could do it for the graph of any of them. So let me just give an example. Um, an example plot. So let's say you have x and t, and I'm going to draw my graph and say blue. So let's say that you have uh, a plot that looks like this. Something like that. So there, we would like to be able to kind of break down what's happening where. So let's talk about that. So first, there's a few obvious points where things are happening. Clearly, something diff something is changing here, right? Now, it was a little bit subtle, but you'll notice that the slope is the same everywhere there, but it changes at about this place. So we can put a uh, put a, vert a vertical line there just to kind of delineate what's going on. So let's just look at what happens in this region. So in the leftmost region, well, let's answer our three questions. So where is the object? Well, 
we know that the x that the position, the x value, the x coordinate, um, is positive for all moments in time. So for all moments of time, for, for the object whose motion is described by this graph, we know that it's to the right of the uh, to the right of the of the origin. Right typically being associated with positive. So that's true for all for all three regions, but in particular, it's true for the first region as well. Next question is. Is it moving or is it a rest? Well, one way that we can look at this is we can <clears throat> just ask, is the position changing? Now, clearly the position is changing for the entire duration, <clears throat> every, or for almost the entire duration that I've plotted. For example, over this, over that range, the first third, the it's not that X can't be negative, it's just that given this graph, X isn't negative. Um, in this range, this first third of the range of t that I've drawn, the position is increasing, or sorry, the x-coordinate is increasing, which means that it's moving to the right. At each instant in time, it's a little bit further to the right. So of course, it's moving to the right in this case. Similarly, on this, uh, this second third, again, it's still moving to the right. It's just that the speed that it's moving at, the amount that it's moving to the right every step in time, decreases as time goes forward. But it's still always moving to the right. Now, here there's a discontinuity, so we're going to ignore that point. In this region, let me put another dotted line here. I'll call this A, B, C, and D, just so I know what to refer to. In region D, the X position is starting off, it's positive, but it gets less positive. It gets closer to zero as time moves forward, right? So in that case, that would be, mean that the X, which started out at some position, say, five meters to the right of the origin, at some later point in time is say four meters to the right of the origin. The only way that that can be hap happening is if it's moving left. <clears throat> Similarly, in segment D, it's the X position is increasing. So again, we would expect that the, or not expect, we, we know that the object is moving to the right. Now, an important point is that between C and D, there is a place where if you ask what the position is a little bit before and a little bit afterwards, it's basically the same. So there's a, a brief moment in time between C and D where the object's just not moving. That's the moment in time when it goes from moving to the left to moving to the right, or I suppose moving to the right. So it's going, it's, it's, it's going to the right, then it slows down, and then it goes back to the left. Sorry, it's going to the left, slows down, and then goes back to the right. Now that has to happen at least because at least when the position is or the uh, when the velocity is continuous, because at one point it was moving left, at another point it was moving right. So there has to be a point in between when its velocity is zero, and so that occurs right there. At that moment, it is at rest. Now the velocity isn't well defined at this point because I didn't draw it well in a well defined way. That's okay though. Uh, things like uh, situations like this don't actually happen in reality, so you don't have to worry about it too much. Last case, speeding up or slowing down or neither. So in this, in segment A, we find that every, say, 0.1 seconds you step forward, the distance that you move is the same, right? Which indicates, or which should indicate for your intuition, that the speed isn't changing. If you are going 60 miles an hour and you drive for one minute, you go one mile. If you drive for another minute, you go another mile. You drive for a third minute, you go a third mile, and so on. That is, indi that is indicative of a constant speed. So in this case, it's neither slowing up nor slowing down. In part B, though, we see that the speed, the, which can be visualized as the slope, is decreasing here. It goes from, say, this slope to this slope. And so <clears throat> whereas for the first second, you cover, say, some, some amount of distance in the x direction, maybe you go one meter to the right. The next same amount of time, you go less far. And the same amount of time after that, you go even less far. You're still moving to the right, but you're just not going as far every unit of time. So your intuition should say that you're slowing down. That does not mean that the, uh, <clears throat> by the way, that you're moving to the left. All it just means is that you're, ex but it does mean that your acceleration is to the left. Remember, if your acceleration is to the left, that means that your velocity is uh, going is becoming 
it's getting closer to being negative. A way to visualize this or a way to think about this is that the uh, the average if the average velocity is to the left does c mean the object's moving in the opposite direction no no, no we're, we're, we're getting there uh yes yes c is moving to the left here i'll put left here right right so in all of these cases they're moving to the right except in c um in part c not only is the object moving to the left but it's actually decreasing the rate at which is moving to the left because if you look at the first chunk of time it moves to the left a lot, but the next chunk of time it moves to the left a little bit less. Chunk of time after that it moves to the left a little bit less, and so on and so forth. So it's it is again slowing down, but in this case the acceleration is positive because slowing down to the left means speeding up to the right, meaning you are accelerating. Your acceleration is positive, positive. Um, and then we can look at D. And we see that the velocity, the speed, the distance that you cover per unit time is increasing per chunk, right? So in this, in part or in segment D, the speed is increasing. You're speeding up. You have positive acceleration to the right. Now you can do the sort of analysis for any sort of uh, plot that you make. Sometimes if there's discontinuities or kinks like I've drawn here, it does get a little bit messier. But nonetheless, um, you can still do the sort of analysis just excluding those points. So those are the kinds of questions that you can answer if you are given some graph and you want to analyze the motion. And obviously, you wouldn't just list out the answer to all of these questions. But what you might do is you might be given a graph, and it will say something like, what direction is the object moving at t equals blank? So then you would go look. You'd say, well, if t equals 13 is here, then you would see, well, what direction is it moving at that point? Well, then you could use this sort of analysis and determine that it's moving to the right. Right. So the second the second uh, bullet point is sketching a graph of a sketching a graph given a description of motion. Um, actually, we'll kind of combine two and three. So the idea here behind sketching a graph is sometimes you'll only be given a description of some of the motion. Let's say that you are told that uh, an object is moving at constant speed. Was A neither speeding or slowing? Yeah, yeah, it had constant acceleration. Um, <clears throat> let's say that, that the description is moving at constant speed to the right. So technically, the only information that, um, yeah, in, in segment A, there's no acceleration. The acceleration is zero because the speed is constant. Um, and we're in one dimension. So if all I say is that I want you to draw the graph of an object who, which is moving at a constant speed to the right, then that's only information about the velocity. So maybe, maybe the first thing that you do is you just draw a velocity graph. So we know that to the right means positive velocity. And we know that constant means that it doesn't change with time. So you might just draw your graph of constant velocity like that, right? Now, the question is, is how would you draw the acceleration graph? And how would you draw the position graph? Well, if you wanted to draw the position graph, you would have to recognize that the velocity, by definition, is the time derivative of position. So the, if you want to find the position graph given the, the, the velocity graph, you have to do an integral. And for most of these things, you can kind of do these integrals mentally. So we know that if you have a, if you have a constant function, then the integral of that would be linear, right? If you integrate the number 5, you get 5 times, with respect to t, you get 5 times t, right? So our position function would have to be linear. So it would look something like that. Now, it doesn't have to be uh, that particular line. It could have been this particular line. It depends on where you start. But it could be any one of those. So when you graphically integrate, sometimes you need to be given some initial position. So I may have told you it's moving at a constant speed to the right and starts at the origin, in which case it would be this bottom line. 
Now, alternatively, you could also draw the acceleration plot. Now, the acceleration plot, again, by definition, acceleration is the time derivative of velocity. And in this case, because the velocity is just a constant function, x of t equals 5, for example, sorry, v of t equals 5, for example, if you take the time derivative of v of t, you just get 0. And so that would just be the 0 function. So let's do another more complicated example of just this sort of interpolating given uh, co uh, complicated motion. Let's say that uh, let's say that you were given information. Why isn't the x-axis for the velocity graph also t? Sorry, that should be t. Let's say that you're given a graph, and you're trying to figure out what. The, say you're given a velocity graph, a more complicated velocity graph, and you want to figure out what the x position is. And, the, and say the acceleration, but it's more complicated. You're given some words that indicate that this is the shape that the velocity graph should be. Let's say in this case, it's something like this. And there's a special point here where the velocity goes from increasing linearly to constant. Well, so this is V, this is T. So we would have to integrate this. And let's say that it starts at the origin just to make things easy. So what we have to do is we start from the beginning, and then we mentally do an integral. So this first segment, that first segment is linear. It's something like v of, a, v of t equals 3t, right? It's just some number times t. Um, now, what would that mean? That, that would mean that the position which is the integral of velocity, should be quadratic. If you were to integrate 3 times t, you would get 3 halves t squared. And because we know it starts at the origin, we know that, it start, that when t is 0, x is 0. So now we just have to draw a parabola until that point in time. And the shape of the parabola, like the, how steep it is, would depend on how steep that v is. But for the sake of sketching, it doesn't really matter. Actually, let me make it a little bit less steep. There we go. It's a parabola. And then we know that the velocity after that point in time here is, const is constant, which means that the position should just be linear. Now, we know that the position doesn't jump. It, the position doesn't change much between, between this point and this point, right? So the position should still just be attached to the same point and then just shoot off linearly. So in this case, it would just look like this. And also, by the way, also we know that the velocity is continuous. So it doesn't shoot off at some other angle. It doesn't shoot off at that angle or at that angle. It shoots off at the angle that the velocity vector already had, or at, at the angle that the velocity already had. There we go. And that's because the velocity is basically the same on either side of that point. So the slope should be basically the same on either side of that point in time. <clears throat> now we could do the same thing for the acceleration. All we have to do is we have to take the derivative mentally. Now, again, these are all sketches, so you don't actually have to like do this calculationally. It's just a useful tool. So the derivative of the velocity graph, well, it's, that's just a plot of the slope. So we know the slope here is positive on the left-hand side, and then it's 0 on the right-hand side. And there's just a discontinuity here. It's not a particularly physical scenario, because there's a discontinuity in acceleration, which there typically never is. but in this particular drawing, that is the case. So these are the kinds of things that you guys would hopefully be able to do. This is like going from one graph to going to another. Can I please explain again how you know the slope will be at that angle? Right. So, so yeah, that's a, it's a complicated point. I'll go over it again. So we know that just before, let's call this t zero, just just as a uh, as a special. Uh, it, so I didn't actually specify what the uh, what's happening at that. Point in, at that point in time, Nicole. So uh, I would just leave them both open. 
because we don't act because it's not it's not given that information is not given. Um, right. So so let's call that point in time t naught. So <clears throat> just before t naught, we know that the velocity is say let's say it's very close to let's call it v naught just to give things name names. So that means that the slope just before remember the slope is the derivative. That means that the slope just before t naught should be v naught. And also, the slope just after should also be v naught, because the the value, the velocity on either side of t naught is the same. This is a property of the fact that the velocity graph that I've given you is continuous. If it's continuous, it means that the slopes should be continuous. The slope should not change abruptly. And so, whatever the slope was at the end of or, or right before t naught, right before uh, you get you get to t naught. The slope should, the slope needs to be the same right after t naught, just because the the velocity function is continuous. And then because the the velocity is constant after t naught, the slope just never changes again. So it just stays at that same angle, that same slope. Uh, hopefully that was relatively clear, but I can talk more about that in detail after lecture. So. Um, that, that's kind of the, the basic gist of it um, as to what to do when it comes to graphing. And it's not like that there will be, I mean, there might be specific questions that are like graph such and such, but really it's this, this, this method of graphing is really just there so that you can kind of visualize and imagine what's going on better rather than just reading words and trying to directly translate it into some, some mental model. You can read words, convert it into a graph, and then you can visualize what's, you can use that graph to help you visualize what's happening. All right, so that's that's all we're going to say about motion in one dimension. However, this is to say that motion in multiple dimensions is basically just a bunch of copies of motion in one dimension. And I can be more explicit about that right now, actually. Let's talk about motion in multiple dimensions. So by the way, when I say dimensions, we're not talking like, you know, the fifth dimension, or in case this isn't clear, we're, we're talking about like, Objects are three-dimensional because they have to live in an x, y, z coordinate space. And like a drawing on a piece of paper is two-dimensional because you only need x and y to describe it. And a point on a line is one-dimensional, or a, the, the position of a point on a line is one-dimensional because you only need one number to describe it. That's all we're saying. So in 2D and 3D, like I said last lecture, uh, we need vectors to describe motion rather than just positive and negative like we needed in one dimension. So everything that we did describe with positive and negative numbers in one dimensions, those all need to be replaced with vectors. So let's just kind of go through the list of the quantities we've talked about, position, displacement, velocity, acceleration, and then just kind of figure out what their equivalent formulation is in two and three dimensions using vectors. So first, let's talk about position and displacement. So whereas if you're only concerned about what's happening along a line, you can just describe the position as a distance from the origin and then a direction. So let's say that I am the origin, then two meters to my right, I might describe with the number two. And two meters to my left, I might describe with the number negative two. Uh, you can't see my other hand. You only need one number, whether it's positive or negative, to describe a position in a straight line. In, say, three dimensions, you need more than just one number, right? Imagine, how do you tell someone where to meet you at, right? You can't just tell them, meet me at F Street. You can't just tell them, meet me on Fifth Street. And even that's not enough. And if, if you're, if, if we, if we live in a truly three-dimensional world, you also have to tell them like what floor of the building you're on. You have to tell them the X position, maybe that's uh, Fifth Street, the Y position, X Street, and then the vertical position, second floor. Maybe there's the, I, I don't actually know what's on Fifth and F. Um, but the point is, is in three dimensions, you have, yeah, you, you, you do technically need time, but that's not something that we're, that we're gonna talk about. Um, 
this is just to specify a position, right? Just to specify a place. Um, and so, so you need three numbers. And it, it could have been uh, maybe, maybe you wanted to go to a basement of a building. Then you would say, oh, the negative first floor, the, the first basement level. That would have a position or like a Z component of like negative one. So <clears throat> you, can, you still need positive and negative values, but now you need three copies of it. And they're all just perpendicular to each other. So they're all just like their own one dimensional motion. So we can do that. With a vector, you can use a vector to specify uh, what direction and how far from the origin. So you still have to pick an origin, you still have to pick a place where we all decide is zero. Maybe that's UC Davis or something like the actual college campus. Maybe we call that position zero and that everything is relative to that. So uh, if you're east, maybe you would get plus x, your plus x coordinate. If you're north, maybe you get plus y coordinate. And if you're up, then you get plus z coordinate. So you need three, you need three positions and you can combine those three, or those, sorry, three numbers. And you can combine those three numbers into a vector that tells you both the direction that you have to go from your origin. And that would tell you how far to go because it would have a magnitude which is the distance from the origin and the direction, which is the direction from the origin. So we would specify our position vector in terms of components. The, the name we typically use for it is R. Sometimes, by the way, you'll see me use X. And in that case, it'd be like X1 I hat plus X2 J hat. That's just a holdover from a more more abstract stuff we're not going to talk about. But if I do just use x with a vector over it, that's what I mean. I usually mean r. And so this position vector is just your x coordinate in the i hat direction, plus your y coordinate in the j hat direction, plus your z coordinate in the k hat direction. Relatively straightforward stuff. And then displacement, exactly like it was in one dimension, displacement is just final position minus initial position. It's just delta r, which is final r. That should be an f. Final r minus initial r. And so that would just be, it'd be your final x minus your initial x in the i hat direction. This is just vector subtraction now. Plus final y minus initial y in the j hat direction. Plus final z minus initial z in the k hat direction. And that now is your displacement vector. And the picture here, let me uh, write this displacement vector. So the picture here is maybe you have a three-dimensional space, uh, x, y, and z. So let's say that your initial position, let's do a different color. Initial position is here. And just that way, then you guys know where it is. Maybe it's directly on top of that point, right? Um, call this Ri. And you, let's say your final position is uh, here. Let's say that this is directly on top of, say, this point. Call that Rf. Well, what would the displacement vector be? The displacement vector describes how far and in what direction you have to go to get from Ri to Rf. Now, one way that we could figure this out is we could subtract Rf from Ri. The way you do that, remember, is you take one of your vectors and slap it on to the, uh, <clears throat> you slap it on to the, you reverse your second vector, and then you do vector addition. But another way to see this is it's just a difference, right? It's just how much do you have to add to Ri to get to Rf. And so we can figure that out relatively easily. If you start at Ri, where do you have to go? How, what direction? Well, you just go this way. So the vector, R, the vector delta R is the vector from Ri to Rf. 
And you would find that if you were to actually do this calculation or draw these vectors, you would find that if you reversed R, if you reversed R i, and then put its tail on the uh, head of is the volume, did the volume go away? Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. Um, it, you would just reverse R i and then put it on the tail or on, on the head of R f. And you would get the same vector, the same vector out. Uh, if you can't hear, it seems to be on on some of you. So um, I would fiddle around with your internet because it seems like most people can hear. So, and if you can't, go rewatch the lecture afterwards, I guess. Right. So by the way, I do link to some um, examples of this in the uh, in the post the lecture notes. So if you want more practice of finding displacement vectors, then they're all there. All right, what about velocity? So just like before, we defined average velocity as the change, sorry, as the ratio of the displacement divide, or rather as the displacement divided by the, uh, the duration. So we can do the exact same thing here for average velocity and for instantaneous velocity, which was the derivative of position. So the average velocity, Again, it's a vector now. This is the displacement divided by the duration. But this is totally fine. You can always multiply or divide a vector by a number. Delta t is just a number. with It has some units attached, of course, but you can do that. And so in fact, what this becomes, written in terms of components, this becomes delta x divided by delta t in the i hat direction plus delta y divided by delta t in the j hat direction plus delta z divided by delta t in the k hat direction. Put another way, this is the average component, this is the average velocity in the x direction in the i hat plus the average velocity in the y direction times j hat plus the average velocity in the z direction times k hat. Remember, delta x del divided by delta t is just the average velocity in one direction right, in, one, um, in a single direction, in one dimension. And so these are just the average velocity in each of those separate three dimensions, separate three directions. And then we can do the exact same thing for the instantaneous velocity. It is just the time derivative of the position. Now, the time derivative of a vector is defined exactly as you would expect. It distributes over addition and so on. So this is just the time derivative of the x-coordinate in the i-hat direction plus the time derivative of the y-coordinate in the j-hat direction plus the time derivative of the z the z coordinate in the k-hat direction. And so this can be written as the velocity, the instantaneous velocity in the x-direction plus the instantaneous velocity in the y-direction plus the instantaneous velocity in the, in the z-direction. So this is what, it, so when I say the, what is, when I ask you, what is the velocity in the Z direction? What this means is it means the component of the velocity that is in the Z or, or the, the, the Z component of the velocity. Put another way, it is the Z, it is the time derivative of the Z coordinate, right? These things are all equal to each other. So let's ask a question that seems unrelated, but I promise it will be relevant and also is kind of unintuitive. So do the vectors r and v have to point in the same direction? So you might think that maybe they should, because all you're doing is you're just multiplying the displacement by a number. And in, for the instantaneous velocity, it's just for multiplying it by a really, really tiny number. right? So you might think that it's just in the same direction. But the answer is actually no. I'll explain why in a sec. So the idea here is we could we could just provide a counterexample, right? So let's just let me just give you a counterexample, and you'll see that it doesn't always have to be the case. So let's say that I tell you that the position of some object is x of t i hat plus y of t j hat. So this is a two-dimensional problem, but that just means that all of the z components and all of the k hats are just not there. And I tell you also 
what the x what the uh, what x of t and y of t are. Let's say that this that x of t is three meters per second times t, and let's say that y of t is just five meters. Right. So y of t is constant, x of t is not, x of t is linear. So then we can figure out what v is just by taking a derivative of each term. So this is the time derivative of the position vector, which is the time derivative of x with respect to t in the i hat direction, plus the time derivative of y with, of y with respect to t in the j hat direction. Now, the time derivative of x with respect to t it's just the time derivative of that function. So it's three meters per second in the i hat direction. Now, what's the time derivative of the y component? Well, that's just a constant with respect to time. So it's just zero. So this just is our velocity vector. Now, the question is, is v parallel to r? Well, the answer is no. And one way to see this is remember that if two vectors are parallel, then the dot product should not be zero. Um, the reason for that, by the way, is that a dot b is equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times cosine of theta. Sorry, it's not that use the dot product's not super useful here, but but you can tell that they're not parallel to each other because r of t has a has a component in both the x in the i hat and j hat direction, whereas v of, v of t, no, it's not a g, that's a 5. Um, v of t just has a component in just the i hat direction. So there will be some point in time when the uh, r of t has, has some amount pointing in the j hat direction, and v of t never has any amount pointing in the j hat direction. It's not they don't have different units. They both have units of distance. If you take time and you multiply it by meters per second, you get distance. Um, it's kind of hard to show graphically, but because I, I would have to show you like an animation. Um, yeah, I can. Uh, let me let me do my best. I'll just draw some a few snapshots. So here's our. Um, or let's just draw it like that. Okay, so here's x and here's y. So we're just drawing the position at different instants in time. The, so if, the, if they both have i and j, uh, j directions, then you'll have to find the unit vectors associated with those vectors. Remember, you can, you can always write a vector as a magnitude times a unit vector. So you'd have to find those unit vectors and check if they're the same unit vector. And then you would just compare the components of the unit vector. Um, alternatively, you could take the cross product of those vectors. And if you get zero, that means that they are parallel. If you don't get zero, then they're not parallel. But that's a little bit more involved. Right, so, so the x position is increasing with time, and the y position is constant. So, let, so, let, so let's say at t equals zero, we know that the x position is, well, zero times three meters per second and five meters. Uh, let me do this in blue. So our initial vector, r of t, points straight up. A few uh, a second later, we plug in t equals one. The x position is three meters, and the y position is still five meters. So then our r our I'll call this r. This is r of zero. This is r of one. One more second later, our r position or our r vector is pointing that way, and so on. So what is the velocity vector? Well, we can draw the velocity vector similarly. I want a thin one. Um, yeah, this will have to do. Um, our velocity vector points just to the right at 3 meters per second. For every, for every moment in time, the velocity vector points to the right. So you can see that the velocity vector is never actually parallel. It's not like it's circulating. No, it's just, it's just moving to the right. The velocity vector is never actually parallel Maybe this would be r of four. It's never actually parallel to the position vector. And so um, after a long time, it gets close to being parallel, but it never will actually be parallel. So by the way, there's an example of calculating velocity uh, in the Libertech, not sorry, not in the Libertext that I found in the lecture that are linked 
There's a link to an example in the lecture notes that I will post after the lecture. I need a quicker way to say that just so then I end up saying it a lot. All right, last thing to talk about is acceleration. Well, if R is constant, then V is also constant, but it's zero. Right, if, if the position is not changing, then the velocity is zero. So the acceleration in multiple dimensions is just similar to what we did for, uh, for velocity. It's the same procedure. The average acceleration vector is delta V divided by delta T, which is just delta Vx divided by delta T in the i-hat direction plus delta Vy over delta T in the j-hat direction plus delta Vz delta T in the k-hat direction. PON, yeah, that's good. Uh, a vector that's zero is, is parallel to every vector. And so we might write this as um, the average velocity in the x direction plus the average velocity in the y direction, j hat, plus the average velocity in the z direction, k hat. Sorry, average acceleration, not velocity. And then we can find the instantaneous acceleration just by taking derivatives, like we just did for velocity. And this just gives us that the that the, uh, and remember, by the way, that the derivative of velocity is two derivatives of position. So this is two time derivatives of the x position in the i hat direction plus two time derivatives of the y position in the j hat direction plus two time derivatives of the z position in the k, k hat direction. And again, by definition, this is ax i hat plus ay j hat plus a z k hat. Nothing fancy going on there. Now, I do, uh, and, and uh, there are more problems like this in the lecture notes, more examples, but I want to make it super clear that remember when we were first talking about uh, motion one dimension, the end result that we got, the kinematics, was that um, if the acceleration is constant, this was in one dimension, then you can write down this list of kinematic equations, right? It's something like v of t equals v naught plus a t, and then x of t is x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. Th th those guys, those guys that you probably learned in high school. So all of those still apply in two and three dimensions. The thing is, is they just eat, they just apply to the each component separately. So you would have one equation for x of t, which would depend on the velocity in the x direction and the acceleration in the x direction. You'd have another equation for uh, the velocity in the uh, another equation for the y for the y component, which would depend on the velocity in the y direction, the acceleration in the y direction, and so on. And so everything follows through. You just do all of the same steps that we did in one direction, in one dimension, and then just distribute it over all of the vectors because integration and differentiation they both distribute over addition. So because the vectors are just added together, the each vector component it distributes nicely. Um, <clears throat> We will, at a later point, get to uh, projectile motion, um, which is an example of where this will happen. But uh, the basic gist is that uh, of those equations is that uh, so. If acceleration is constant, let me say, if a is constant, the vector. And by the way, when I, a, a constant vector just means that each of its components is constant, right? Then the velocity vector as a function of time is the initial velocity plus the acceleration times t, the acceleration vector. And this is a vector equation now. It, it contains an x component, a y component, and a z component. Similarly, I was about to do the thing. The r component, or the, the position vector, is the initial position vector plus the initial velocity vector times t plus 1 half times the acceleration vector times t squared. Everything follows through. And it, now, when you read these equations, this means that there is a, that vx of t is the initial velocity vector in the x direction, or the, sorry, the x component of the initial velocity vector, plus the x component uh, of the acceleration times t. The y component of the velocity is the initial, it is the y component of the initial velocity vector 
plus the y component of the acceleration times t, and so on. And then you would get the same thing for r of t. And there'd be three equations for v of t, three equations for r of t. And all of the manipulations that you can do with vectors, adding, subtracting, multiplying by scalars, those all still hold. And similarly, all of the equations, all of the things that you can do with two vectors, dot products, uh, cross products, and so on, those still hold with, with these functions now. These are just vector functions or vector fields. No, they're not vector fields. They're just vector functions, vector valued functions. And we'll see a lot of examples of these later on. Um, and those are the examples that I linked to in the lecture notes. Right, so there is a few more things to talk about. Oh God, we are really doing bad on time today. Um, I'm gonna have to speed along. Yeah, R naught is the initial vector. Um, so there's this notion that you can talk about the direction of a vector and the magnitude of a vector and kind of treat them separately. So I wanna talk about that for a little bit. So a, a vector that's changing in time can both change its direction and it can change its length, right? So unlike in one dimension where the position can only change its distance from the origin, now a vector can change its distance from the origin or its like angle from the origin, right? So the, note, the idea here is that both velocity and acceleration involve derivatives of vectors. They involve acceleration is a derivative of velocity and velocity is acceleration is derivative of position. Um, <clears throat> and so, but a vector is just, a vector is just a magnitude and a direction. So we can treat the changes in those properties separately. So remember, by definition, this is what it means to have this unit vector. If we have a vector R, we can write that as just regular r without the vector symbol. That means the magnitude times the unit vector that points in the direction of r. So here, this is the magnitude of r. And this is the um, unit vector in the direction of r. So <clears throat> then, the velocity vector, which is just the time derivative of the position vector, that's just the time derivative of r times r hat, right? That's like, this is just directly plugging in. And then we can use the product rule, right? Then we can write that this is dr dt times r hat plus r times dr hat dt. Now, this is where things get a little bit confusing. Um, to understand what this means. But we can think about this, right? So, so what, is, what does this term mean? What does this quantity mean? dr dt where there's no uh, vector symbol in the r. Well, r without a vector symbol is just the magnitude, right? So this, is, this, this quantity here, dr dt without the vector symbol, just tells us the rate of change of the position vector sorry, the rate of change of the length of the position vector. This is the change in speed. This term on the other hand, sorry, yeah, you're, you're right. It's, it's, it's the speed, it's not the change in speed. It's the, it's the change in length. Um, yeah, this is the, just is the speed. Actually, no, that's not even quite right. Um, what it really, I, I won't give it a name. I will explain what it means in just a second. But the idea here is you can, you can break it up into these two chunks. And let's, we'll, we'll talk about those two chunks in a little bit more detail now. Uh, it's already two o'clock. Um, okay, well, uh, let me just finish this. How, how much longer will this take? This will take a good while. Uh, okay, I'll say one more thing and then we'll call it a day and I'll leave you uh, in, uh, in limbo. So this, so, so this, the magnitude can certainly change. That's no problem, right? The magnet, like the distance from the origin can change. That's usually what happens when things are moving. Um, you might think that dr hat dt is zero because well, r hat's just the unit vector. So how could it be changing? But keep in mind that 
a vector isn't changing if it's mag isn't only changing if its magnitude changes. It could also be changing because it's, it could be changing its direction. So dr hat dt captures the moat captures the way that the velo the way that the position is kind of changing its angle relative to the or relative to the origin. So imagine like you had a vector that uh, goes from here to say here to here and so on, right? As your position vectors. Well, the direction, the r hat, you know, the r hat vectors are still changing, even though the magnitudes are all one. So this is not necessary, not necessarily zero. Which is just an important thing to note. All right, so I'm going to end lecture there. We are, I got very behind, um, which is a bummer.